welcome to Parsons. We're delighted to see everybody. Uh, I'm aware we've got lots of students here. I'm aware that there's some people from the press and some friends of ours from outside of uh, this noble institution. And we're all here to see the work, uh, see the words of the person that's responsible for the incredible work we just saw. So without uh, wasting time with an introduction, which we'll cover when we actually start talking, please join me in welcoming Alice Templey. having me. So Alice, thank you so much for being here. Um, of course, part of the reason you're here is because that incredible book you've just published to celebrate 10 years uh, in the industry. Um, but I want to start at the very beginning. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what it was when you were a kid that made you decide you really wanted to be a designer, if indeed that's what you thought you wanted to be? Uh, I never really grew up thinking that's what I wanted to be, but I was always... Um making things from a very early age. We didn't have a TV until I was 11. We lived in the sticks in the middle of nowhere. Our parents had a um, cider farm. And basically, just a, we were always making things, because that's what we had to do, either playing around outside making dens or making things. <laughs> so I, and then I started making things like earrings when I was 11, and I sold them for about £1.20 each. And I think people that come in to buy my parents' cider felt sorry for me, so I had regular customers. <laughs> then I started making mirror surrounds with um, some printed, I learned how to print, and sold them. And then when I was at St. Martin's, I started making stuff and selling stuff, basically to pay my way. And then again at Royal College to pay my way. So I was always making and selling. And that was the, kind of the easiest way when you're studying, because it got, it's so expensive, especially when you're doing textiles um, to pay for all the materials. You have to keep running it through. So selling stuff was the easiest way for me to... It, it speaks to um, something that we believe very much here, which is uh, the importance of artisanship, you know, being able to actually make something. Because it's one thing being able to work a computer, and we know that's pretty important a lot of the time. But actually physically being able to make something. Yeah. I mean, is that something that you still return to all these many years after having you know, been a kid and worked on whatever it was you were making and then gone to school, etc.? Do you still find yourself wanting to get stuck into the fabric? Um, I think that's why I do it, it's because I enjoy making things and that's what keeps me kind of going. And the reason that I do what I do is um, not because I ever wanted to be a fashion designer, it's because I enjoy making things. <laughs> and when I started making clothes, we had a collection and I sold it and then I produced it and I had to make another one. And all of a sudden, 10 years later, I still kind of get surprised really when people say fashion designer because I think my work is about surface decoration and pattern. And you saw a very unedited version of everything <laughs> just <laughs> uh, across many, many years. Um, and it's really about um, creating things that have um, high attention to detail and pattern. And that is the bit that I enjoy. It's just building a business around that. It's a whole other thing. And luckily, we have a business to make me, uh, allow, enable me, I guess, to do what I like. So I'm lucky. I mean, you certainly get that impression from the book. You know, it shows the, the, that there are countless pictures of you actually doing things, you know, making things. And I know that uh, there are certain designers who might be hard pressed to come up with lots of pictures of them actually doing something. Uh, I mean that in a nice okay. way, obviously. Well, I'm pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty hands-on. I mean, I'm on my hands and knees, covered in marker pen and, and stuff most of the time. I don't have really time to brush my hair. I mean, I'm doing most of the um, artworks and all the patterns still myself. In fact, I only hired somebody last week to give me support, and after doing um, four mainline collections and bridal and diffusion, I think that totals, as well as extra projects, is about 18 collections a year, probably. Blimey. And um, I'm um, probably a little bit of a control freak, so I did most of the things myself, and learning about how to do textiles to actually teach you about weaving a fabric, jacquards, knitwear, um, beading, print, and I specialised in print. So you learn about all the processes and it took me a long time to delegate. The I learning started. thing, I, I want to I come to that, but actually a bit of housekeeping. Um, I'm going to be asking for questions from the audience. Uh, and those of you that are students here know that we like very, very good questions. So um, no silly questions. Uh, and at about uh, half an hour into it, I'm going to actually open the floor for questions from people. So let's, uh, let's show Alice how smart the questions are that we ask. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Gretchen, if you can let me know when it's half an hour, I'd appreciate it. Um, so... Let's talk just for a minute about your experience as a student, because, of course, this is Parsons. We do things in a certain way here, um, and it's fairly well known how we do it. Uh, and we're, we're very familiar and very respectful of what happens in London at Central St. Martins and the Royal College. Um, you know, and we, we love what they do, and I'm sure they've got um, uh, cautious approval of some of the things that we do. 
Um, but I'd love to hear about your experience, uh, anything that sticks out, the kind of things that you learned, and maybe the things you wish you'd learned, things you'd needed. Uh, I think I did a three-year degree. Um, actually, I told you in the lift that I almost applied for Parsons when I did some work experience in New York. Almost. Fell in love with New York. Almost stayed. Um, and then ended up taking my place at St. Martin's. Um, and uh, St. Martin's was obviously brilliant. It's like the equivalent of Parsons, but in England. And um, it's fantastic, obviously, for certain courses and not others. And I think when I did the textile course, um, it was brilliant, but we, I, our teachers and people kept being fired, so we were basically left by, on our, by ourselves. Um, and we were uh, very much thrown into processes, so we were used, basically using the equipment in the dye lab, in the print lab, um, in an amazing library. And it's the first time that I'd lived in London, so I was having a great time working all nights in bars and um, working really hard at college. Um, and I really learned about how to use the equipment and also how to use London um, and to feed off everything that's around. Like you can feed in New York of all your amazing galleries and um, just feeding on people around. Um, it's really interesting important. you say that because it's, it's a really important part of the Parsons experience, absorbing yeah. New York. And it has been for the people that we've spoken to who've been here 25 years ago. And I'm intrigued that you say that about the, your experience in London difference. too. Where your yeah. college is situated really, really makes a massive difference. To be in the heart of any major city, obviously, is going to give you a huge advantage. Um, and then, because the equipment and things were obviously, I couldn't then, I almost started carry, well, carried on making clothes, but to be able to do that, I needed print rooms. And I didn't feel like my experience at St. Martin's gave me enough um, knowledge with how the industry worked because we were very much left by ourselves for about a year and a half. Um, and so I went to St. Martin, I was sorry, Royal College to do my masters. And each month, I think, you had um, projects with external people. Uh, you also had to redo your portfolios every two weeks. Um, just covered in crap and dye and ink and paint the whole time and loved it. And it was just a really amazing way to kind of understand how you could commercialize what you do, how you would use manufacturing, how you would um, work with outside people, really, how you present yourself as well as um, your work to people. Basically, that's, how to sell yeah, yourself. That's really interesting, yeah, the, the selling yourself, because so many designers seem to think that that's not part of what's needed. You know, it's all about just creating great products and that will do the job. But selling yourself is clearly absolutely vital. I think the way that your company, you, established an image right from the beginning, and a genuine image, you know, a reflection of who you are as a person and who the company had to be, was really important. You know, it wasn't like you could just switch it off and go and adopt another image like some companies do. I think we were very lucky that we had um, something that was quite unique, and there was definitely sort of a passion, and everything that I do is very much, is very um, tactile. And it comes from me. I'm not going by anybody's rules. The last thing I am is a sort of conceptual minimalist. <laughs> uh, the opposite. Um, I have uh, sort of lots of things bubbling, and to edit is the um, is the key thing. But there's just lots and lots of um, things to um, to play with. I think when you have your got lots and lots of ideas, and you understand all the different processes and ways of doing it, it really shows in the work. I think when you have with passion and I threw everything at it, and I think that I, hopefully showed. I think the, the editing word there, I really want to pick on that, because uh, students that are in the audience, you'll hear this a lot. It's one thing to, I mean, we, we turn out a lot of work here at the school, um, and people are required to produce and produce and produce and produce, but focusing in and editing on what's important. And I think particularly given the, the, the luxurious nature of your collections, you know, the richness of detailing, and yet you talk about editing, you know, I think that's, that's really important. And I couldn't at the beginning. The first show, I had no idea. I'd never really been to fashion shows before. I did 60 looks or something bonkers. Right. And um, everything that went on there. And I, I mean, I still like it because it was quite innocent, naive, and naive. Right. Kind of, um, but yeah, learning to edit now, making quick decisions and doing so many collections, but much more focused and knowing a little bit more about, obviously, the business and the needs of each line. But at the beginning, I didn't have a clue. <laughs> so, so, that, so if you were going to advise students to, to think about certain things when they're at school, it almost sounds like they need to make, the, I won't say a mistake, they need to go through the learning process that you went through. You know, they almost need to go a little bit wild and not edit year one so that they can get everything out there and then maybe come back to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I did everything and loads and loads and loads of work at St. Martin's, and again at Royal College, loads and loads and loads of work. And then... Um, 
and the, uh, the sort of first before we started sharing was trying out lots of different products ranging from bikinis to um, obviously the leather I did to dresses to this to that to the other I was trying everything and you had to um, learn how to do everything to understand what was needed in the collection what you were able to do and, and we I think we have 25 different stories in each collection that ranges from obviously leather knitwear jersey beading planes of detail lace um, jacquard whatever it happens to be so you have to learn about all of those different elements and also look at how you can use them which brings them all together um, but it's really about finding your own handwriting and also what you enjoy because if you enjoy something you're going to excel in it if you're trying to do other things to please other people then you might as well just stop um, and I'm very adamant about that is that the collection has to stay focused it has to stay what I want and my taste rather than me trying to do it for somebody else because if you're doing it for somebody else you're going to get it wrong, yeah. I think. So um, my muse is the people around me and um, I get my family and my friends and myself. And if we wear it, there must be some other people <laughs> who want to wear it. <laughs> but I'm certainly going to, um, you know, design that's, you know, keeping pure to what you really, really want and, um, and a passion, really. It's trying to... You're designing, you're obviously enjoying it and there are areas that you're going to enjoy and excel at. So it's about finding... What you enjoy, really, it's doing that. That's a, that's a really important message because, yeah. you know, so many people seem to think, what's on trend, what should I be doing? Yeah, and that's nonsense because the moment something's on trend, it means the high street will be doing it two weeks later and then by the time your stuff's hit the store, it's all over the place. And if you like something, it's obviously a reason you like it. You're not sick of it, you like it. And, um, and that is, again, staying true. And it's just having a self-belief and um, determination, I think, just to be... Yeah, focused. It, it's, uh, yeah, it, I mean, your particular training and experience makes me wonder whether you were able to articulate your belief because you hadn't overlearned about other things. You know, you knew about textiles and you knew about creating something in a sort of artisanal way, but maybe you hadn't been exposed to as many fashion designers no, as all, someone yeah. else might have been. So you, were, you just sort of put the, the things you knew together and they became the, the outfits and that became your handwriting. Yeah, I, do, I didn't study fashion, obviously, if anybody doesn't, doesn't know. I just did textiles the whole way through. And every time I, I remember asking the um, dean at the Royal College, I said, I want to go and do some um, pattern cutting. And he's like, you're not a fucking fashion designer, you're a textile designer. So uh, I was just like, oh, God, here we go, boring. And so I just carried on doing my own stuff. Um, and he's just said, you, either you can cut patterns or you can't cut patterns, somebody else. Either you can cut patterns or you can't cut patterns. If you know what you like, you can make it. And I think that's really true. You have to learn a skill other than just, I mean, pattern cut is obviously an amazing skill, but you have to learn what your passion is and your skill is. And my skill is details and, and texture, pattern, colour, um, beading, anything that's sort of detail. I, mean, I should have probably been doing arts and crafts, the arts and crafts movement instead of doing fashion now, but I'm, I'm passionate about detail and um, that will show in my work. So, um, well, I think there's something else though that you, you touched upon um, and that is looking for the right people to partner with. Because you know, mm -hmm. if you're good at something, and you, you understand that, and if you're not so good at something, you work with the right person who is good at it and defer to them in that area. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned you know, your friends and family around you, and I'm sure that they handle a lot of the things that you just wouldn't want to get involved in. So, I mean, one of the things that we talk a lot about here at the school is relationships, you know, being nice, being someone that actually people want to work with. I mean, what kind of people do you, apart from obviously your husband who's your business partner as well, what kind of people do you work with um, whose opinions you really value? Um, well, we grew up very, very, very quickly and we had just kind of lots of friends around us that were involved and my sister that was in charge of sales and um, it very organically it grew and as the business grows, um, it evolves and staff evolve and um, we now have, uh, you know, the best team that we've ever had because we're in a, a brilliant um, position of, um, you know, knowing what we've, we've been doing for 10 years and understanding it. Um, and then people around me I really listen to. I listen to my friends, I listen to my family, I listen to all the people that we work with because we're working with a really professional, brilliant team. And um, now I've learned to delegate to, to my team. And um, you listen to, um, you have to listen because you, I can't do anything without a good team because it's just absolutely impossible. I mean, we have 75 members of staff, I think. Um, six members of, seven men members of management we, we meet weekly. Um, and then I have a team of four and a half, to half because she's only part-time, uh, designers. Um, and 
you have to respect the people that work around you. And I have been a control freak, but I'm much more relaxed because my team is much more uh, experienced than ever has been. But it is about learning how to work with people and learning how to delegate. It took me quite a long time delegating a bit. But yeah, they don't, <laughs> you don't necessarily <laughs> learn that at school, do you? Right. But it, I mean, we, we, of course, we have, um, uh, there's a television show they make here and it seems to preach the sort of prima donna approach. And we all know, certainly everyone in the school knows that that doesn't work. The whole team thing is absolutely vital. Yeah, I mean, if I was to act like that, so like, you get a caricature of what fashion design is supposed to act yeah. like. And if I was to act like that, I think I would be, my legs would be cut off within two seconds. I'm from a very grounded home. And I think that the, the sort of typical fashion persona that people think of the fashion industry is horrific and it's really terrifying. So when people say, you're a fashion designer, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a fashion designer. I prefer to say a designer <laughs> rather than a fashion designer because they just think, oh, God, you're going to be a nightmare. You're going to have airs and graces. Um, and on top of that, you probably don't do much. <laughs> but, but it's actually, interesting, though, because at the same time, you've got to be supremely confident. You know, every six months or indeed three months or, or even more often, you have to put your entire ability on display in front of everyone. And you've got to take the vicious criticism that might well come. And you've got to remain humble. Yeah, I mean, we started showing, and I, I did a show because that's how I wanted to show and obviously sell. And, but I had no idea the politics that went behind all the reviews and the fact the whole industry and the views. I mean, I didn't know. And so you open yourself up to a public stage and a global stage every um, six months, with two lines. So that's, that's four kind of show collections we do. Um, and that was a bit of a surprise. And luckily, we had amazing support. And I think the support we had was because we were humble and because it was obviously quite an innocent story. I wasn't opening myself up, being kind of pretentious and doing all this sort of um, conceptual stuff. It was making clothes to sell stuff and enjoying it and being part of my lifestyle. And um, so we were lucky. But yeah, they, you, don't, you have to be quite tough um, skinned. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I am really, but I, uh, I've been lucky enough to just I keep my head down. I'm in my office most of the time, so yeah, what happens, happens. I'm lucky we've <laughs> had support. <laughs> so what do you do when, when there are setbacks? Because everyone experiences them. I think setbacks, obviously, um, my husband's clever, obviously. So with the recession, major setback of just worrying about and protecting ourselves and being prepared for uh, loss of sales through um, department stores not growing, people um, going bust left, right and centre. Um, obviously, a good business brain. Obviously, it's going to hopefully preempt and help you survive stuff like that. Um, pitfalls uh, mainly. I think the worst ones are um, if there's any product problems with production. So, for example, if you're producing something, you always have more than one supplier just in case something goes wrong. Or fabric people, if you've got problems with some sort of fabric, then you can cover yourselves by, you know, always having two people. I think that was one. Um, really 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 important thing so you never get caught short um and obviously with the fashion industry you have to deliver if you don't deliver on a certain week at a certain time then they will won't pay for their order or accept their order so um the hardest things are logistics and understanding those will prevent you from having <laughs> setbacks <laughs> so but I, I like the um the point about working with your husband obviously so many of the really successful designers that we're familiar with have got business partners and you know whether they happen to be life partners as well, I don't know. But but um, finding someone that can do those bits that you can't do to free you up to for your expertise is vital. Um, I, I like. I'm interested by. I mean, if you look in your book, you'll see countless pictures of your team for the Christmas card or something, and that's very uncorporate. It took me hours. I mean, we had about 75 people, and I had to superimpose all of their heads into little Indian Indian Raj people. And oh my God, it took me two days once. And I thought, what am I doing? No more Christmas cards. They don't happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I guess it made people feel pretty special to be included in that. Yeah, they were really nice. I mean, it was 15 people. It was easy to do. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh my God. In fact, I think there was about 110 people at that point. And um, I never did it again after that. But it's important in the work industry. We're certainly not corporate, and to feel like it still is a family-run um, thing. And everybody, um, I mean, I've always said, if you can't kind of go to the pub and have a drink with someone at work, then you know, they're not the right person to be working for you or with you, um, I think. Um, I, still kind of, I still stick by that. Um, and, um, yeah, that's it's key. An, it's an interesting point, because uh, here at Parsons, we're very challenged for space. 
Um, we don't have a lot of the things that the big universities have, and one of them is a bar. And of course, in England, I you went don't to, have a bar. No, <laughs> we don't. We don't. And it, that's where everything happens. That's the absolute focus. That's what happens in England. So it's too. very different here. You know, no. it's, um... <laughs> so um, uh, you've grown into a number of different uh, sectors of, of your business, you know, the bridal and then the diffusion line, etc. How, how did those decisions come about? Um, bridal was quite... Um, everything's been very organic as we've grown um, and very true. And, 2002, I got married, and my wedding happened to be picture was it, of it was in vogue. Then people asked me to make their wedding dresses. Then I started making bespoke wedding dresses and bespoke wedding dresses and bespoke wedding dresses. And then I was just like, I, either I make bespoke wedding dresses and I can't do anything else, or or we have to do something else about it. So we decided to do a off the peg bridal line that we update every six months. So that was purely so I didn't have to deal with mothers of the bride, brides, people I didn't know, uh, controlling husbands who, oh, I've, what I've seen, bridal fittings. Uh, it's much better to have a room with um, beautiful dresses that they can choose from <laughs> and then uh, just choose the brides that you want to work with. So now I do about three or four bespoke a year and that's more than enough and always for people that are really good fun. We have a, a, a phrase over here called bridezillas. And that's yeah, pretty much and the, the mother-in-law's the worst, or the mothers, the mothers, or whatever. So there's, some of them are really nice, some of them are a nightmare. So it, <laughs> <laughs> clearly, the, the message there is uh, the fact that it was organic. Mm. You know, you were doing something already, and this was a natural extension of what you were doing. Because it feels like, you know, that people sometimes put together marketing plans for how they should expand their business, and that seems to be exactly the wrong way of doing it. Mm, I think people, um, it's really come natural fit with us because Templey is all about sort of dressing up and dresses. We're known for doing dresses and the detail within it. It's kind of ethereal dream like quality of some of the more elaborate pieces. So lots of people were coming to us to have things made in white and then uh, the wedding happened and then and then it's it's really taken off the bridal business. And the diffusion collection was different. That was um, questionable whether that was the right thing to do or the not the right thing to do. Um, already having uh, the main collection. But then when a recession comes and bites you on the arse, you're like, OK, if people aren't going to have enough money to buy dresses, what are they going to be doing? Are they going for the bridge collection? Are they going to... Uh, what are they going to do? So we decided that in the structure that we already had and the team that we already had and suppliers, pretty much, that we already had, we were going to give a shot of doing the diffusion collection. And I did that pretty much in a space of about two weeks, the first collection. And... Um, that again was smaller than it is now, and it's just understanding what that identity is, who the customer is, and it's actually played out. It's probably the same customer, um, what is, um, but it picks up a few younger people at the same time, and people that buy Templey is more of an occasion um, piece will go to the Alice line and buy more for everyday wear, so it's much more functional and versatile. And we did that when the recession hit so we were able to pick up more doors and pick up more interest and have a little bit of something going on rather than everybody closing all the hatches um, we were actually doing something when it was doom and gloom and it kind of worked and it's it's still I mean you're learning with all the different collections all the time but it's definitely got its own its own kind of area as has main nine which is coming a lot more um, um, sort of luxurious and a lot more um, refined so, with so much product, um, how do you maintain the integrity of it? Um, I'm a control and maintain your own your difficult. own sanity. <laughs> um, as I have a really regimented diary, and what we call, which I hate the word, I should call it a plan, but they call it we call it the critical path. Yeah, and every month that. of every year, with every collection, is exactly what I need to be doing for each one: launching swatches, doing print fittings, launching second prototypes, travelling, da da da. So it's all in there every single week of the year that is um, planned. And if I didn't have that, it would be absolutely impossible. Um, and we stick to it. And um, the integrity is kept by being very quick with making decisions and knowing exactly what I like and what I don't like. Within a, within a second, I'll know what I like and what I don't like. And you have to learn how to um, make decisions and be confident with your decision. And I think that's, um, that I'm, there's no dithering around. Anybody that dithers around, dithers around drives me nuts. So you have to make a quick decision about everything and um, believe in your decision um, and stick by it. So the integrity 
stays that way. And also because I'm very much about, I think, the print and the pattern, I know exactly what I like as far as that goes. And then obviously the team is make sure that the fit's always right and the kind of um, technical side of it's always followed. So once you've got the framework of everything, then the actual kind of decoration of that um, is quite easy to decide on. I mean, having a very strong identity makes that a lot simpler, I'm sure, for the team to understand. Because there's going to be no mystery that you like something or not. It'd be a bit fine-tuning. So um, on the subject of the logistics and how you run the place, I'm interested in, you come from a very artisanal background, but I'm intrigued by um, what role technology is playing in the way you run your business. Because, of course, getting to a certain scale, it has to be present. I mean, what, what role do, does that play for you? Um, when I was at St. Martin, no, Royal College, I just got a first email account. And um, it seems like I'm ancient, but oops, that's true. And I was always used Photoshop. And that's basically, I never got into Illustrator or anything else. It was just Photoshop. <laughs> and still is just Photoshop. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, I'm quite good at Photoshop, but it's still just Photoshop. Um, and uh, technology, as far as changing from when we first did things, it was all obviously paper patterns, and all the paper patterns were sent across the world. And now um, the internet is vital, and we'll cut patterns on card, then we'll upload them onto our Gerber system, and then the Gerber system will either print them out um, beautifully for us to artwork, rather than us drawing around all the patterns and artworking this. It'll print out as many of those patterns as we want, which is a joy. And then um, we can email patterns to suppliers that have the same technology. Um, and that has really reduced um, and changed the way that we've worked over the last three, three years. Um, and then obviously being able to cut up any trim and any um, sort of anything, bu buttons, buckles, anything like that. Uh, it's huge. I mean, God, without the email, even though you curse the amount of emails, um, it's imperative. And people, to have designers don't that don't have any computer experience or, or CAD experience of any sort um, is quite unbelievable nowadays. You have to be clued up. The junior people, actually, that I've got, that I've trained up from being interns, two of them in my office who are brilliant, their experience and their productivity through being able to use CAD is completely un... Uh, it's just, it's brilliant. To the older designers, not that they're that old, but the ones that were too lazy to learn how to use it, who might have a great eye, unless they can actually show you or be productive or learn how to get it made, um, you need to have that experience. That's really interesting because because uh, your collection is at a certain level and there's a certain perception of it. But for us to understand that that designing on the computer plays such an important role, because of course that's not the only thing that one does, but it plays such an important role. Because there are designers that that you know we talk to here who you know maintain that everything has to be done by hand and that's it. And we know that that's probably not the case. But it's it's really heartening to to see it, the simple acceptance that we just have to do these things. Yeah, I mean our. Um Main, all of the patterns are obviously done by hand for the mainline collection in the studio in London. But then when they come back, if there's any changes, I'll get a few centimetres in here, or the trouser leg from show needs shortening 10 centimetres for normal people, um, then we'll just run that through the computers, rather than unloading all the patterns and cutting up 10 centimetres of the graded thing. I mean, the card that we got through was ridiculous. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, it just speeds things up. It's kind of archaic not to be able to understand them. So going from um, the, the logistical to the, the sparkly, what have been some of the highlights over the last 10 years? I mean, the book commemorates the, the, the first 10 years, I'm sure, of many more to come. Uh, so what have been some of the highlights? Um, first show, obviously. Um, How did you feel? Knackered, because the backstage was about this big, and I had about um, 20 girls. And no, just no idea. So we were scrabbling around doing shoes and trying to kind of absolute chaos on top of each other. Um, it looked fine at the front, but um, how did I feel? I felt good. And I did think, oh, shit, what have I got myself into? Because now I'm going to have to go through that every six months. You can't just stop. You have to keep it going. Um, and the next highlight was, I think, um, Annie Leibovitz coming to photograph us in London. We were selected to represent designers in their 20s, when I was in my 20s. 
Um, I think Stella was in her 30s and Richard was in her 40s and Carolina Herrera was in the 50s. So I was really flattered because that came from nowhere. Really surprised, amazing to have her support. And great that whole kind of production of articulated lorries trying to get into our tiny little cobbled muse in London with her lights. That was quite an experience. Um, the MBE, obviously. Congratulations. Thanks. You stand in awe. Um, I bought myself a little crown today just because I love the Queen. <laughs> um, <laughs> Does anyone know what that is, but incidentally? Um, a member of the British Empire. It's a decoration that uh, the monarch bestows upon worthy people, uh, very few worthy people, uh, and it's an amazing honour. Did you actually get it from the Queen? Wow. She was on a little stage and said a few things to me. It's very nice. <laughs> Quite an experience. But I think it, it, it's testament to the, um, the importance of the fashion industry. Because it, was, you know, it wasn't so long ago when it would have been ridiculous to imagine someone in the fashion industry getting an award like that. Yeah, I thought it was a joke, actually, when um, Zoe sat over there said in the office, <laughs> Alice, I've got something you should look at. And uh, I was like, what is it, Zoe? She said, I've got a letter from the Queen. <laughs> no, I haven't. Uh, I was the Prime Minister, it was. And uh, I'll have a look at it. Because they ask you if you'll accept it, it first. It was on such crappy paper <laughs> in a really crappy envelope. I thought somebody's having a laugh. And then I uh, think we should reply. So we did. <laughs> <laughs> and because you have to accept the fact that you've been offered it and then tell them you're going to accept it. So we did. That was from <laughs> Prank people like... or not, it wasn't. <laughs> so that was good. People like the Beatles when they said they'd accept it and then they didn't in the end, is to avoid all that. But, uh, oh, wow. no, of course I'm going to get a medal. I would love, love all of that. Love, yeah, have great. you worn it yet? Yes, I have worn it. Um, I did wear it that evening. I don't know what I'm telling you. In the pub? No, no, I, no, it wasn't the pub. No. <laughs> we can use your imagination for that. I'm not going to ask. Uh, I'm just wondering where is it? I know where it is. It's in my drawer of my desk. <laughs> So, um, no, I love it. So I'm going to frame it. <laughs> <laughs> Memory. <laughs> Remind self. So tell me about the book then. What was the process of uh, putting the book together? Did you learn anything about yourself when you finally got to see 10 years of what you've done? Yeah, I went to the publishers this morning and I said, right, that was the learning bit and now the work's much better. Can we do a year <laughs> off? Um, and then, yeah, of course, learning through. I felt like I've gone through my whole training, well, in the book is obvious, um, from the beginning all the way through. But the nicest thing I think now where we've got where we've got to, we've tried lots of things. We tried to be a little bit more um, uh, this kind of styling went a bit wayward about three years ago, I'd say it was um, I work with a male stylist and I'll actually I'll only ever work with women stylists from now on just because a sensual woman's body is very much something that we're we're um, and yet, known for. Male designers can do such exquisite things for women's bodies. It's true. Um, male designers can, but I think ours is a very feminine product, and um, it's definitely a very feminine product, mm. and the cut is definitely for um, a woman's um, curves. It's not in any way straight lines. It's very much, and a woman knows how that, often how that feels. It's, it's different, when you're wearing clothes that have been cut by a woman, you kind of, you can tell. Just you have thinking to of have the, the tits and the arse to know how to make them feel comfortable, I think. So, so what else did you learn about yourself then, looking back on this 10 years? Because it's, it's a, that's an amazing thing to do, to gather all the images from 10 years and put them all together and think about them and articulate them. Yeah, we were lucky enough to be a little bit of a sort of kleptomaniac magpie um, and have 300,000 images on our server. So um, I worked with my sister and we printed out um, for each... Um, year one to ten endless thumbnails and we just circled things that we thought told uh, the story um, and worked with a fantastic layout woman um, art director and um, it came together I think in about four months after about a year of archiving all these pictures <laughs> um, yeah it was a really lovely process and it really did learn I mean taught myself what the um, I guess the, the real essence was, and it's really, you saw it in the beginning and you see it in the end, and there are things you experimented with throughout to try to kind of push yourself in another direction. And that's why I said it's really important to follow what you enjoy, because it's the things that I enjoy that were in the beginning and now at the end. And the bits that I found difficult, you could tell that I found difficult, because we were trying to do other things, and um, you can tell in the work, so it's really interesting. 
yeah, have we, to enjoy we certainly, these. Um, yeah, we encourage people to keep their sketchbooks so they can see what the process was they went through to get to the end result. Well, I've often, got sketchbooks from 1993. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hundreds of sketchbooks. Child prodigy. Really important. <laughs> So, um, uh, questions from the audience. Can we put the house lights up, please, so we can see who's asking? Uh, do we have any? And I shouldn't I give my little speech at the beginning. I see one at the back. We actually oh, we have a microphone. Perfect. Uh, oh, God, you can hear me. <laughs> OK. Um, I was, oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I was wondering, you said uh, your business partner is your husband. Did you, were you already together when you were business partners, or? Really, the question is, what were you looking for in a business partner to like select? I'm about to say, my husband. Uh, um, we no, we met, mm -hmm. and I was actually still at um, the Royal College, and then we went to live in Asia for about six months together. And where I was learning every day about resourcing, and after learning about English production and Italian production and silk mills and things, I went to live in Asia. So I learned about silk mills and things out there and production, and um, and came back. And we think we lived together for about a year in London. And it was a point where we lived in a flat which was about five floors up and and about three or four rooms and. Uh, you couldn't get from the bedroom to the kitchen without going through corridors of boxes. And I would get here, but get back from work, and I carried sort of half a ton of knitwear up the stairs because the courier refused to help me. <laughs> and it got to the point where the flat was uninhabitable, and um, I was absolutely knackered. I had a pseudo name. My name was Lulu. I was the bitch from accounts, and then I was <laughs> me, who was really nice. And uh, so there were, and then there was a girl, my girlfriend Sophie, that I worked with. So there was. There was, th there was th uh, two of us, but really more because we had pseudo names. And um, <laughs> <laughs> basically, Lars just said to me one day, "Okay, either we do this properly or <laughs> stop. Uh, shall we? We um, we'll work, we started working together. So he then set up all the kind of more um, practical business side of things um, and the structure to it. And um, it started from there in 2002, I think." Um, and what was I looking for in a business partner? Well, I didn't actively look for one, he just arrived. <laughs> and I married him. Um, and uh, we didn't know anything really when we started. We both started quite um, naively, we were both learning about it. We had no idea, I didn't even have any idea how to invoice. I just had to sort of, you know, and wholesaling and all things like that. Uh, I learnt, and we learnt hard and fast, and uh, it was knackering. But, um, if you're passionate about something, you make it work. It seems to have worked. He's sitting in the front row if anybody wants to look at him after. <laughs> uh, another question. Oh, look at you lot, Tim. Right. I think the question as well for the answer to that, if I was looking for a business partner and he didn't just walk along, it would be somebody that had the belief and also um, wasn't in any way going to try and... Um, well, you have to decide what roles you play, really. And luckily for me, I do everything aesthetic. Um, I understand some of the other things, and he's obviously very good with the business side of things and, um, um, and clever. So we understand each other, but we don't question what the other person does, because you've got to have 100% belief in what they are able to do and what they bring to the table. And you should never go into business with somebody that you, you, you question. They have to come with something, and with something that you don't really have, but you have to understand. Uh, you have to have, obviously, mutual understanding. And obviously, if you're a designer, it makes sense to have somebody who's... Uh, a fantastic business brain, but probably hasn't got that much taste. <laughs> not that my husband has taste, sorry. But no, somebody who's not going to question your vision. So somebody has to believe in your vision if you are a designer and you want to be a business partner. Otherwise, it, we, there will be conflict, I would imagine. Well, they're the same people, aren't they? I mean, the business person has to understand that they don't understand certain things, and nor should they, but they have to defer yeah. to the expert, which is the designer, and vice versa. Yeah. You certainly find that in the most profitable relationship. And the, the designer also has to listen to... Uh, numbers and what works and what doesn't work and obviously try and make that person happy as well as keeping your vision um, right. So if you're designing beautiful dresses and he wants to make money doing t-shirts, you're in the wrong, you know, wrong partner. <laughs> they have to want to, uh, to get to the same place as you. Another question? Yes. Your doors, that you, the stores that you're selling in the United States now, can you tell us a little bit about 
how many doors you're in, how many stores, and what your plans for expansion, because I know you're doing bridal, and are you planning to expand into other bridal registry products, things like that? Uh, we, now we come to New York uh, four times a year with both lines, and we sell here for two weeks before actually the fashion shows in London, we'll take a week actually before the fashion shows in London even start, so we always make sure New York is the most important place to start, where the book's open and to where the first show is, and then obviously Paris is at the end, so you've got that kind of whole run. Um, with the recession, obviously, it's difficult, more difficult for quick picker growth in America because um, things, obviously, for everybody slowed down. So focus now is to come back with our bridal, which is obviously a brilliant business for us. So we're doing the bridal shows. Um, that's very exciting. Um, we're going into some bridal um, stores. We're doing a, a trunk show tomorrow with Bergdorf. So they're being very, very, very supportive on our um, main line and doing ex both bespoke and uh, exclusive things for them. So we make you know, show collection dresses and then we do them in special laces for them. Um, and that's brilliant. Um, and they're great, obviously the best. They're a great team of people. And that's fantastic to have their support. And then we go out to LA and we've got a store in LA that does very well. On, um, and then um, uh, it's really important to basically see the stylists and to see um, buyers and to see press things. And it's now important after the um, baby in recession for me to have visibility here and actually to be here because you can't expect to have a business somewhere without being present. Um, and that is something that you have to remember as a designer is that you have to actually have, a, uh, you have to be the, the connection between product and the world. Um, so I mean, we're looking forward to Bergdorf's tomorrow. It's going to be um, a big trunk show if anybody wants to come. We'll be there. Sixth floor. <laughs> I think, uh, again, so just coming back to a point you made, um, being able to articulate your vision, you know, being able to communicate what you're doing and being prepared to do that as well. Because, again, you know, there are designers that just think it's beneath them or they all can't be bothered or just don't think that's how they do it. I mean, I was in Japan working with Junior Watanabe and he, his attitude was, no, my clothes speak for themselves, you know, that's all I'm going to do, which I think is very difficult. You know, maybe for him it works, but it but doesn't really seem to work, certainly in this country. You know, they want the personality there, which well, is different to it being a personality-driven collection, because that's not it. But, you know, it, it makes it genuine if you show up and you're actually there. I like to feel that there's kind of life in our clothes and they're, they are, there's so much passion that's gone into them they kind of have a life of their, their own and I want people to realise that when they wear them hopefully they'll feel a little bit of that and so it's not, we're not designing a minimal things, they're things that you should wear and celebrate and feel like you know, dressing up and um, feel kind of um, your, your best in them and I think people need to understand that to be able to you know, bring people's attention to things because there is so much product out there, and there are so many stores, and um, that's why you know having the back, back, background of Bergdorf is really special, is because you get that uh, customer attention. You get somebody who really knows the brand. You get it's not just um, you know in a rack somewhere. It's you know it's, it's important um, that the product should be you know treated and. and I can't believe I'm saying this, celebrated, because it makes me feel like we should be celebrating. Um, frocks. <laughs> frocks. And they are, they didn't they? They're only clothes. But I'm passionate about making them, and I want people to be passionate about wearing them or feel um, empowered and, and sort of sensual, I guess, when they're, they're wearing them. But it is only clothes at the end of the day. But people do <laughs> feel that, though, you know, and I think that's one of those balances, isn't it, where you're right, it's only clothes, and we've probably got enough it already. It makes you feel but, a certain way. Yeah, you've got, and you've got to believe in it, and they've got to believe that you believe in it. Because, you know, the buyers are very discerning and the customers are becoming increasingly so. And they can see through it. You know, if it's not, if you, don't, if you vacillate between one theme and another, people recognise that and it doesn't work. So, which, so, do we have another question? Sure. What was the difference between showing your collection uh, in London and showing it on the runway here in New York? Uh, we came to New York, uh, I think we did about five seasons in New York, I think. Um, and uh, it was uh, brilliant because obviously New York is a uh, you know, high um, volume, powerful, celebrated, uh, incredibly huge business. Um, and in England it's not, it's a different sort of business. So over here the fashion shows we had huge support. Obviously we had amazing support from Man of Winter, um, amazing big venues. The uh, best thing was you have all the best girls here. They sometimes come in London, or skip London, and just go straight to Milan <laughs> for the advertising money, obviously. I'm sure a lot of you know that. Um, 
Uh, so that was really, really good. It was basically professional, amazing space, amazing team, amazing support, and the best thing was absolutely brilliant girls. Um, in London, it's very, very creative. Um, fashion weeks have really um, improved dramatically over the last few weeks, as far as, uh, far as we weeks, sorry, years, of people um, going to London. And um, obviously, well, obviously there's Milan, Paris, London, and New York. And that's a huge amount of travelling. And unfortunately, London was, um, people could, just couldn't go everywhere. So not very, very important buyers just missed it. And now there's a lot of effort from the London Fashion Council to actually bring in those people. So it's becoming more and more um, um, important. And um, also, our London designers are much more commercial now than they were. A lot of designers are obviously whipped away straight away to New York and show in New York and they show in Paris, but a lot of designers now are staying in London have actually been given a lot more support through the Fashion Council and various grants, and they have learnt by necessity to be able to learn how to sell their product um, and also be given more, more help. So um, I like showing in both places, but the reason I went back to London, one, because I was pregnant and I had a fashion show five days before giving birth, um, and um, we're English and it's very, very important for us to be stick to our roots, and if you're an English brand, to make sure you don't lose the fact that you're an English brand. Um, so we've shown in the British Museum for the last few seasons. That's not a bad place to show. No, it's not. Will you take your MBE <laughs> with you next time you show there? Because it's kind of fitting. <laughs> okay. So one, one last question. You had a store in Soho, and it closed from what I've oh, seen. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm just wondering if that was a business decision because of the recession, and also what was the emotional impact for you, because obviously you're, you're invested in your product and showing it. Yeah, I think when... Oh, is that me again? It's at like you. Um, <laughs> when, when recession um, happened, it wasn't just because of the recession and kind of people be having to tighten their belts. It was more that we had two lines and um, we needed to basically service exactly everything we were doing, be in control of everything what we were doing from our head office in London. So we had a satellite office over here. Um, and we improved our team dramatically in London to be able to support the rest of the world. So our now sales team travel from London, our press team's in charge of everything from London. And um, we really outgrew the space and it was amazing. It was obviously a 5,000 square foot loft in Soho. It was great for the parties. It was great for having it as a showroom through the selling weeks over here. But it was not where we are as a brand now, which is much more sort of polished and um, focused, I say again, um, it's not where we should be showing. First, it was, on, it was on what you Americans call the second floor, which is what we call the first floor, second floor. Um, and uh, you have to have, ring a buzzer to be able to go up. And it worked brilliantly because it was the kind of opening to America. Uh, but flagship, really, it has to be a proper flagship. So our focus now is London flagship. And um, our LA shop is obviously very successful. And New York will be next. But it's like you only do something, you have to do it properly. Um, and so it will be proper and it's in the pipeline. <laughs> and it's not going to be on the second floor. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're here to talk about the book, um, apart from anything else. And, and I would encourage everyone to have a look at it. It's really, it's wonderful to see the evolution of a designer from, you know, from this raw textile focused um, initial kind of outpouring of ideas in your first show to the, the way it's evolved and, and become a much more sophisticated operation. Um, the last thing I would ask um, uh, before we wrap up is really what, what are you thinking about for the future? I mean, you've been very organic in the way that you've evolved. So what, you, have, you have a very strong image and it's very personally driven, both company and brand. So what kind of things do you think you might go into next? Well, I've always felt slightly pigeonholed being fashion designer. And I have a few projects that I've wanted to do for years. I haven't had a chance to pick up. Um, and I think at the moment, hopefully there's many more years to be able to do those, um, at the moment it's really focusing just on the three lines and not trying to do other things within our brand. I mean, we obviously do work for Barber, we've got an exciting collaboration, I can't say, coming up. We've got other things that we do, but not to do too many of those. Focus on what we're doing, focus on retail, um, and then, you know, kids and having kids and designing for kids. Um, I would like more of. I'm a lady. <laughs> so <laughs> I've only got one. Um, no, you're not a lady, you're an MBE. <laughs> uh, lady comes next. 
So it's focusing on the three things and having them where um, the, the, the DNA is obviously now we understand those, those they can start working a lot more um, with delegation so I can really start focusing on other things and what we'll introduce but only after sticking with those three for another few years. And then it might be interiors or it might be whatever. But well, three things is enough for the moment. We're looking look forward to it. <laughs> so what time's the uh, trunk show tomorrow at Bergdorf's for those that want to go? Trunk show starts tomorrow. I don't know what time I need to be there, but what's the trunk show? Two, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Uh, so, uh, Alice Templey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Board.